Hello. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm Solokan Noah, Rabbi Vincent P. Adams, and I am a Jew by birth, an ordained minister of the Christian faith. And I'm here in, in my sukkah. This is day four of sukkah yeah. for the Feast of Tabernacles. And throughout this week, you know, uh, maybe one or two other times, I'm going to um, do a little talk and a teaching on various subjects that I think are apropos to this time of the year, as well as to what we're going through yes. in the world today with the coronavirus, the upcoming election, which is under 30 days away now. And we did the first teaching on Saturday, which was the first day of, of Sukkot, or the first day of Tabernacles. And this is the fourth day, and this is my second talk or second chat mm -hmm. or second teaching during the feast. And I have titled this particular talk, The Evolution, or Why I Support Trump, or Why Am I Voting for Trump, mm -hmm. okay? Especially since I'm African American, you know, I, as I said, I'm a Jew, and I'm a Jew by birth, by way of Ethiopia, but I'm also African American. So, that's my makeup artist. <laughs> I love it in my life. Okay. So I had not this past week, I think it was the weekend before, I had promised several of you that I would answer some of the questions that you brought up in some of my um, my posts since um, Rosh Hashanah or Tishri one. And there's too many of you and there's too many posts. For me to respond to them individually, too many, too many different threads, mm -hmm. and so what I decided to do was to make this video, and that way I can make it available to all of the different groups that I belong to. It'll go through all the th different threads. I can even tag some people to make sure that they get it, and you know, get their questions and concerns. And in some cases, their accusations uh, dealt with and answered. That's good. So that's why I'm doing this particular um, teaching here. First of all, I just the format that I that I've chosen is to sort of give you the evolution of how I got to this point because it's very different. One of my fraternity brothers from college, Gene Bell, uh, commented a couple of weeks ago, about a week and a half ago, and said, Vince, you weren't like this in college. What happened? And so here I am. Uh, the evolution, in my opinion, began in 1975. I was a freshman at the University of Michigan. I was 17 years old. And one night, one Saturday night, probably was a Saturday night, I'm sitting in my mother's car with my girlfriend, Camille Kane. And we're sitting in the car on Belle Isle, which is an island that sits in the middle of the Detroit River between Windsor, Ontario, Canada, and Detroit, Michigan, the USA. And we're sitting there, it's kind of a lover's lane, you know, it's an island, it's a park, and we're sitting there listening to some music probably, and I turned to her and I asked her the question, I said, should Angela Davis be free? At that time, Angela Davis was, you know, still in jail, 1975, and she looked at me and she said, yes, she should be free, and I said, yeah, I, I agree, but why? 
And Camille looked at me, she said, quite emphatically, because she's a political prisoner. I said, okay. And then my next question to her was, what is a political prisoner? Because, you know, I had just graduated from high school. I was a freshman at Michigan. And I still didn't know what a political prisoner was. I've heard the term for years. And perhaps some of you out there don't even know what a political prisoner is. Uh, right now, you might be hard-pressed to just give a, a succinct de definition. And I said, okay, all right, she's a political prisoner. Then I looked at her and I said, what is a political prisoner? And she said to me, I don't know. And I said, I don't know either. So I, you know, reiterated my question. I said, well then, should Angela Davis be free? And again, emphatically, she said, yes. And I said, why? And she again said, because she's a political prisoner. And I said, well, how can you say she should be free because she's a political prisoner and you don't even know what a political prisoner is? Hmm. And she still said, yeah, but she should be free because she's a political prisoner. And there began, that night, began my evolution. I always wanted to know why. And evidently, what had been going on, both of us had been hearing this term, political prisoner, thrown around, you know, everywhere. You know, it was the 70s. We were just coming out of, of the 60s and the assassination of King, the assassination of Malcolm X, the debacle with the Democratic uh, Convention in Chicago. All those things, you know, in that term, political prisoner, and a, a, a lot of other catchphrases were going around. And... Somewhere in that mix, I wanted to know why. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a button that said, Free Angela Davis, you know, she's on the button with her fist up and everything. And I'm a black man. I'm a young, strong, virile black man. I'm down for the struggle and everything. And I'm like, Free Angela Davis. And one of the main reasons I wanted to free because she was fine. <laughs> she was a good looking sister. How else could I have a chance of getting a date if she's in prison? <laughs> they got to let her go so I can get a shot at her. Okay. <laughs> you know, but I'm like, yeah, free Angela Davis. And so, you know, I could see that I wasn't getting anywhere with my conversation and questioning of uh, my girlfriend. So we went back to listening to music. And then about... Oh, almost five years later, somewhere between three and five years later, I'm questioning again. Now, mind you, the following year from that night was 1976, the bicentennial, and it was the first time that 18-year-olds were given the right to vote in a national election. And I remember voting in the cafeteria of my dorm, South Quad, up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. You know, I voted straight Democratic. Boom. Democratic all the way down. Voted for Jimmy Carter to be president. Now it's, oh, goodness, about 1980, 1981. And I'm asking myself, why am I a Democrat? You know, in high school, I worked on uh, the campaign to elect uh, Coleman Young, who was the first black mayor of Detroit. And after, after college and moving to Chicago, I voted for Harold Washington, who was the first black mayor of Chicago. Both, of course, were Democrats. And also in my freshman year in college, I ran for campus-wide office you know, with the, you know, the black student organization that was present at the time at the University of Michigan Dearborn campus. I was elected to um, the office of Minister of Defense. So I had always been 
uh, somewhat of a black activist, you know, going back into, uh, you know, junior high, high school, working on the uh, campaign for, you know, for Coleman Young, along with my mother. So, you know, Democrat was like in my blood, you know, voting Democratic and so on. You get the picture. But all of a sudden, at age 21 or 22, I'm like, why am I a Democrat? Why am I, you know, voting this way? And I was in Chicago, and I was living with my father. My parents were divorced. I was living with my father. And so I asked my dad, you know, I said, why do, why do we vote Democratic? Didn't really get an answer. I had a girlfriend at, the, at that time, Marsha Nosworthy, oh boy. <laughs> who, she was a student at the University of Chicago. She was from Queens, New York, and she was black, Jamaican, Irish, very uh, light complexion, red hair, and green eyes, and her parents, you know, were from Jamaica, and she was a hostess. At, a, at an event at the University of Chicago, a pri it was a, a private dinner for Senator Percy. I can't remember his first name, but I believe, if I remember correctly, he was a senator for uh, the state of Illinois. And she wanted, she was a hostess, and she wanted me to come. She says, I got a free ticket from you. They're serving food, Vince. I want, I want you to be there. So I said, okay, I'll come, I'll come, and I'm there, and I'm sitting there, and I'm listening to Senator Percy, and basically he's giving one of those speeches that politicians give when they don't think there are any cameras around, hmm. and they think they're with their own, and they can let their hair down and say what they want to say, say things that they wouldn't say to the general media right. and the general public. Right. And as this man spoke, he scared me to death. I'm serious. I'm not exact exaggerating. I was actually afraid. He was bragging on the fact that his daughter had married one of the Rockefellers and how proud he was and happy that she married a Rockefeller. And he talked about money, money, money. Not about doing anything for anybody. You know, I always thought a politician was there to do something for you, to help you yeah, in your struggles in life. This man just talked about money, money, money. And this is the first time I heard the phrase, a couple of million dollars here, a few million dollars there, and pretty soon you're talking about real money. <laughs> I said, oh my goodness, okay. And then he made the statement, you know, all these student loans out there and everything, let me tell you what we're going to do. We're going to get a computer, and we're going to track all these people with these student loans, and we're going to get our money back. And the crowd was just, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, oh my God, what has he got against people going to college? Isn't that a good thing for the country? Mm -hmm. This man just wants to hunt people down and get, you know, the student loan money back. And I was like, and you know, and, and the whole speech that night was like that. Hmm. Uh, and like I said, it frightened me. Now, not because I had student loans, because I went to college on a free ride. You know, I didn't have any student loans. But I just said, my goodness, you know, uh, what kind of talk is this? So at that point, that was around 1980, 1981, I said, now I know why I'm a Democrat. And I went home and I told my father what happened. And he said, yeah, old man person, you know, uh, not old man person, old man Julian, I don't know if this is true, this is just something my father threw out. He said, yeah, his father, if he got on the streetcar, and a black man was on the streetcar, if a black man got on after him, he would get off. He wouldn't even ride a streetcar with a black man. I was like, wow, you know, okay. <clears throat> mm. So, 
I know why I'm a Democrat. It's 1981. I'm a Democrat. I know why. I've been a black activist uh, ever since junior high and high school, working on this political campaign, voting for these two uh, black mayors, the first black mayor of Detroit, the first black mayor of Chicago. I know who I am. All right? Okay. And also in college, uh, plays for Mega Sci-Fi, which is a uh, black fraternity dedicated to social activism and the uplift of the African-American uh, community, not people. only in the United States, but everywhere. Africans and black people and people of color everywhere. So I know who I am and why I am this way. Later on in life, um, I wound up in uh, Stanford, Connecticut, and I started or initiated a, a mentor group for African-American high school students while I was in Stanford, Connecticut. I also work with the Urban League in their Drugs Destroy Dreams, mm -hmm. you know, working with at-risk at African-American um, youths. You know, these young men have been told by the court, you got one more strike and then you're going to jail. And so I was a volunteer to work with them. We used to take them out on camping trips and go through ropes courses. That's like these obstacle courses, you know, <laughs> where you gotta climb up ropes three, four stories high and jump down a zip line and all this other <laughs> kind of stuff. And we would hold encounter groups with these men and, and you know meet with them every week, talk about the struggles they were having and things like that. And so that was, you know, the type of man I was. And that was in uh, 91 and 92. And not to mention that I was um, the, um, the director mm -hmm. of the Chester A. Addison Center, which was located within the largest housing, public housing project in Fairfield, Connecticut. Fairfield County, Connecticut. Right. And I was the executive director. You know, and I had all of these kids from elementary school or junior, uh, uh, kindergarten all the way up through high school that I was responsible for. And I had teachers under me. I had dentists and a doctor. And I directed all of these services, plus came up with a budget for it. You know. And of course, they were all black, you know, it was in a public housing project. Mm -hmm. So that's who I am. That's who I was at that time. I st still am that person. Staunch Democrat. All right? I got married in 93. And Sister Leslie and I, we, you know, we met in church and uh, the largest uh, black church there in Stanford, Connecticut. We married and then we moved to Baton Rouge, Louisiana and began to develop spiritually. And that was in uh, November 27, 1993. Then in the spring of 1994, I heard the audible voice of God calling me into the ministry, calling me to preach. And that was something that I never, ever wanted to do. I never ever imagined myself a preacher. I wanted to make money. <laughs> okay, I wanted to be an entrepreneur like my father and make money. I wanted to, um, you know, I attended church regularly. I wanted to give tithes and offerings mm -hmm. and do what I could to help the man of God, the preacher. But I never wanted to be a preacher. So one day I heard the voice of God calling me into the ministry. Okay, all right. I had already started my spiritual journey uh, back when, um, probably a year or two before I met Sister Leslie. And shortly after that, when I got my call, I started ministering to people unofficially. We were members of, you know, the local church there. And people started coming to me for advice. 
and ministers started, you know, people who had long since, I, had, I wasn't even ordained yet, people who were, were pastors of churches were coming to me for spiritual advice. I was like, wow, you know, well, what's this about, okay? Yeah, true. And then um, I got a call from Oral Roberts University, the, the school, there's Graduate School of Theology and Missions, invited me to come for uh, a graduate student weekend for the seminary. I went, first time I was slain in the spirit. I said, well, it seems like the glory cloud is here and I should come here to go to seminary, which I did. That was an incredible experience. Okay. Truly. And once I, I had enrolled, I joined the local church, uh, a church that had um, experienced a profound move of the Holy Spirit with signs and, wonder, uh, and wonders following. Joined that church. That was the first uh, integrated church that I had belonged to ever. I grew up in the black church. I was, uh, uh, my mother was an elder uh, in the black church. And we always had African ministers coming through as guest preachers. And one of the things that they would talk about was how the white man came to Africa with the Bible in one hand and reaching out for the land with the other hand. I'm pretty sure a lot of you have sure. heard that old saying. Yeah. So, you know, I grew up hearing that from junior high, you know, through high school. So. You know, I was firmly planted in the black community, in the black experience, as, you know, some people may call it. And since I started supporting Trump, openly supporting Trump and telling people I'm a conservative, uh, I guess that makes me a Republican or what have you, uh, and especially lately with this election, of 2020 that's, that we're in the middle of right now, I was, um, I've been called an Uncle Tom. Yeah. I've been, I've, my blackness has been seriously okay. assaulted and questioned right. by just, some people. And the battery is all low on that. I'm going to get a charger. But um, people have suggested that I needed psychiatric help and I must be brainwashed, All kinds of you know, All kinds and that's the reason why I wanted to kind of tell you my evolution from staunch Democrat going back to the 70s, not just someone who was black and maybe voted, but someone who was active and involved in the black movement from junior high all the way through college all the way through adulthood into my late 20s and early 30s. And the evolution pretty much starting, really, um, I say it started in 75 and continued on. But after I was ordained in 1994, moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and started seminary, I guess it really kind of progress as my spiritual development increased that's kind of when the evolution you know where people might say they could see it and I was very skeptical of white missionaries maybe even had a disdain for them until I went to seminary and I actually began to meet some and got a chance to get a view into their heart and why they were missionaries, what they believed, why they were doing what they were doing. And so that evolution, my heart began to change, uh, began softer, so to speak. And I had suffered many forms of racism up to that point as well as Sister Leslie, uh, you know, and her family was involved uh, in the struggle as well. Her father was one of the first 
uh, African American men who was an executive with the IBM Corp, Corp, uh, Corporation, and she moved around quite a bit as a, you know, as a young child, as a father got promoted to this position and transferred to, you know, this part of the country and that part of the country to take over, you know, this office or that office. She was actually a childhood friend, as was her family friends, uh, father and mother, friends with the parents of Senator Cory Booker. And she grew up with Cory Booker because his parents were IBMers as well, moving around. So she was a childhood playmate. Her and her brothers and sister were childhood playmates of Cory Booker. That's right. Okay? And, you know, I had ex experienced racism. Uh, my mother was an educator. And I used to go skiing back in Michigan, in, you know, in Brighton, Michigan. And I had white folks come up to me and ask me, what the heck was I doing there? You know, shouldn't you be playing basketball or something? You know? And in my profession as a commercial and residential real estate appraiser, I'm the first certified commercial appraiser ever and still in the state of Oklahoma. And the second Louisiana. commercial appraiser in Louisiana. Louisiana. Yeah. Well, I was the first and only. I was the second oh, yeah. in Louisiana. I uh, probably was the first in Mississippi. I just yeah. I didn't bother to check. But whatever. Now, you know? Oklahoma story is another story. I you so that. I had, you know, when I would go to professional meetings and go to introduce myself, I would say, hey, I'm Vincent Adams. They would look at me and go, wouldn't shake my hand, look at me and say, I know who you are. Really? Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. All right. So, with, you know, and Sister Leslie had experienced racism, you know, as a little girl, being the only black, you know, white suburban school district. And, you know, how, uh, you know, the students treated her. And then in Westport, Connecticut, an all-white suburb, uh, you know, in Connecticut, not too far outside of, uh, of New Manhattan, New York, her brothers were, when they would be coming home from school or if they had a part-time job, coming home at night, they would, you know, be stopped by the police, you know, wondering, being asked, what are you doing here? Because we're no, no, black, no people. black people supposed to be here. But they were. You know? <laughs> and her father had to just go into the police station and say, look, my name is Lemuel Nixon. And I am so-and-so and so-and-so. Mm -hmm. You keep arresting my two sons and questioning them on the way home from school and their part-time jobs. I live here. Here's my address. Stop harassing my kids right. to put a stop to that to let them know black folks indeed live here so both of us had grown up with that type of harassment and I, I can I can tell you much more but sure. for the sake of time I, I want to move on so we're living in Tulsa Oklahoma I'm going to seminary I've joined my first integrated church, first time outside of the black church. Mm -hmm. I'm growing by leaps and bounds spiritually. I had, even before I was ordained, I had read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, from cover to cover and studied it. And now I'm getting deeper and deeper into the Bible. And right before I started this message to you, Leslie said, when did we officially become conservatives or Republicans or whatever? And I said it was in uh, the middle of the first Bush term, the first term, in the middle of the first term of Bush two. What is he, what is he called? Uh, 43, President 43. Okay. And they were just starting to pass laws allowing same-sex 
marriage. And Bush came on TV and said, he said, I'm going to in introduce an, um, an amendment to the Constitution out loud, same-sex marriage. I said, that's it. I can't take it no more. I'm voting Republican. And Sister Leslie said, yes. Okay, somehow, even though we didn't talk about it with each other, we were moving in that direction because of our spiritual beliefs. Not because of brainwashing, but because we were reading and studying the Bible and all its principles and precepts. So, for Bush's second term, for the first time, we voted Republican. And we have never, we had never missed an election, voting in an election. I've never missed voting in an election in my life. And when we got married, we made sure we voted absentee ballot. Okay, back in Connecticut. Democratic, straight Democratic, boom, boom, straight on down the line. And I didn't mention that uh, Sister Leslie's grandmother was very active with the uh, Democratic Party in Pittsburgh. Was she a precinct captain or right had some kind of war captain? I, right. I forget what the exact title was, something my, like my that. My father's mother, Grand Nana, she was the chairperson of Pittsburgh. Chairperson of Pittsburgh. Sister yeah. Leslie doesn't want to appear on camera today. <laughs> <laughs> You women, you know how you women are. Well, I'm behind uh, the camera. I'm she's, she says she's behind the camera. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Amen. But, okay, so we voted. Voted for Bush, too, in his second term. And, boom, we were off to the races at that point. Same-sex marriage was being legalized, which is an abomination before the Lord. Um... Roe v. Wade had already been the law of the land. Uh, you know, I was, we were quite upset about that. Even before we um, voted Republican. And that's my evolution from the 70s. It happened. Okay. You still there? Yeah. I, the, I don't know. Yeah, I'm still there. I, I didn't skip a beat. I had you on, not, you know, call us That's off. okay. You know, all right. What are people going to do? Okay. <laughs> so, I wanted to give you that back, uh, you know, that background on myself and Sister Leslie and I. You know, so people don't say, well, you know, he was probably an Oreo from the beginning or something, or blah, 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 and la di da this and la di da that, and nothing could be further from the truth. So, yeah. Uh, Lester Spence had a question. He said, so does a candidate like Trump become a means to an end? You vote yes. for him primarily because he does the things that you want him to do legislatively? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Repeat uh, Brother Lester's question again. Okay, Brother Lester Nice said, and loud where people can hear. Lester Spence, thank you so much for your question. He said, so does a candidate like Trump become a means to an end? You vote for him primarily because he does the things you want him to do legislatively? Absolutely. You hit the nail on the head. Um, one of my frat brothers in that um, string of posts that I did a week and a half ago, he asked, so is Trump for God? And my response to that was, nobody can know what's in a man's heart except God. But I do believe Trump is being used by God. I don't know what Trump's motivation is for supporting this type of legislative le legislation. Maybe he just wants to be president. Maybe he just wants the power of the office. Okay? But the fact of the matter is, legislatively, he is putting the country in line to overturn Roe v. Wade and abolish abortion, abolish legalized abortion, or at least put handcuffs on abortion rights to where it might as well be illegal in as many states as possible. So yes, you're absolutely right. I believe that 
Trump, now, Sister Leslie, I believe, she believes that Trump's heart is for God. I'm not saying that it isn't, but I don't want to be naive and, you know, because, you know, I'm the skeptic. Remember, I'm the one that, that wants to know why. Why am I this? Why am I that? I want to know why, even in my faith. You know, I've studied, I've read the Quran, I've studied the Quran, I've studied other religions, because I don't want my faith to be an accident of birth. And we're actually, we're also Chinese medicine students. Okay. We're That's working fine. on our doctorate in Chinese medicine. Okay. So, as I said, I don't want my faith to be an accident of birth. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to recite things. Because that's what's that's the rhetoric that's going on in the black community. I want to know why. Thank you. I want to know the principles that I'm fighting for, or that I'm standing for, not that I heard it in the barbershop. You get me? Right. Okay. That's not enough of a reason for me. I want to know. And Sister Leslie was watching something on Netflix called. Uh, what was it? Last night. Last night. Social, the social dilemma. The social dilemma. Which our sister Ashley Hope uh, told me about. Okay. And it talked about how Facebook and social media is manip manipulating us into these things. So a lot of people have their viewpoints because they've been manipulated into it from social media. And you know, I hear, you know, these questions, how, how can you as a black man be for Trump or a conservative or a Republican or what have you? And I ask, you know, what has Trump done to black people? Name me one thing that Trump has done to black America. You know, which, which one of our rights has he taken away or has he or, or, or said he's going to take away? And I can't come up with one. Yes, the man is not politi politically correct. And even white people who support Trump or who are going to vote for him for whatever reason, you know, I see it all the time. I say, gee, I wish he would just <laughs> stop talking sometimes. Say, so I think he just likes getting people riled up. And, you know, that's why he says some of the things he says. I don't agree with a lot of things Trump says, but I like his actions. People are blaming him for, you know, the coronavirus. Ridiculous. You know, I don't believe that we would be as close to a vaccine if it wasn't for Trump. I don't think Obama or Biden could rally the private sector and get them to stop doing what they're doing and manufacture uh, uh, what do they call them? Not incubators, but um, um, ventilators. the ventilators. The Get ventilators, them to open PPE. up, change their uh, entire plant operations, and we go from a deficit of ventilators to a surplus that we can now supply to, you know, the world with. Right. You okay. Know, the ships, the nursing, the doctor ships, or I think you had crews come in on the ships. You know. Uh, hospital ships. I mean, yeah. he did so much. But, you know, but the media. But like everybody wants, wants to blame him for COVID-19 because he doesn't wear a mask. I just have to point that out, like you're saying about Facebook and social media, that they're creating people's world view. Literally creating yeah. the world view. People so who if don't you believe this really way, think. they feed more and more things from the social media posts of other things, or they just feed other information to keep you believing in the way that you're believing. And that you don't get a contrast. You don't get the other side unless you search it out. You know, Biden gave you a hint of it when he said, "If you don't vote, if you don't vote for me, then you're not black." Mm -hmm. That was crazy. It wasn't crazy. But he was really reflecting how social media and other voices of opinion, without any basis in real fact is guiding mm -hmm. the overall uh, population of black people and, and others, you know, to the point where he can actually say, you ain't black if you don't vote for me. 
You know, I'm supposed to be playing basketball and voting Democratic. Okay? I can play ball. All right? And I can dance. You know? But so what? And you can rap. You know? Whatever. But I'm still black. I'm a, I, I'm a thinking black man. I want to know why. Because the Democratic Party really has not, it, you know, the Republican Party even has, you know, neither party has really done anything uh, for black people as a whole. And, and, and really, Trump is the first, one of the first. Uh, Bush was pretty good. He appointed a, a lot of uh, black people to his cabinet and other positions. Uh, Trump let out thousands of black people who were improperly sentenced and incarcerated because the, the Democratic Step Party right. the first Step had, had, you know, under Clinton, who I voted for and who I liked, had termed us uh, to be super predators and, and decided to lock us up and throw away the key. And Trump started opening up about that and letting us, uh, certain people who had made a mistake, go free so yeah. so in a way uh, you know plus in a way Trump has done you know something for black people as a whole you know we have the lowest unemployment rate for blacks so where you know you people have to educate me I don't know everything I haven't heard every newscast I you know like I said uh, you know, Sister Leslie and I are working on our doctorates mm -hmm. in Oriental Medicine. Uh, I run a business. I'm a commercial and residential real estate appraiser. I operate a ministry. You know, I have nine children, so I have to be a husband and, you know, and father to my children. I could miss a lot. Okay, so if you know something, if I miss something, you know, let me know. What's the next question? Yeah, the more response, thank you for Brother Lester Spence. He said in response earlier, Brother Adams, what you said about Trump and the virus isn't true. It isn't factual. And then he said, I can understand voting for Trump because he supports legislation you agree with. But what's happened as a result of the virus is his fault. That's the fact. And then he said, and thanks, what, thanks. What? Then he said, thanks for this. And so that's his input. He thinks input. the violence is Trump's fault? Virus. The virus. Okay, I disagree. I don't know how long you've been... I, I've seen your name uh, before in some of the responses uh, to my posts. I don't know how long you've been uh, following me, though. Um, I had COVID-19. I was in the hospital in a coma on a ventilator for six days. My voice still has not come back. And, in, you know, according to the doctors, it may never come back. It may just come back overnight or it may never come back. And I'm still, you know, I'm weak. I can barely stand up and walk sometimes. I'm still suffering the, effect, the effects of COVID-19. And I wore masks. They clean my hands like crazy. Very, got, very so. You know, he was better than Monk. Yeah. <laughs> they call me Monk. Yeah. And my daughter actually got it from a food delivery bag. Or from the food, you know, in the bag. Because it was a contactless delivery. And she opened up the door, got the bag. Boom. Next thing she know, she's got COVID-19. And... No mother, probably no parent, is going to quarantine their child. Because when she got it, my wife sat by her bedside. And she was sick approximately three days. You know, like a bad flu. And then, like, we have six of our nine kids are still at home. All six of them got it. But it, you know, there was no more than a cough, a headache. When was asymptomatic? Okay, one was asymptomatic. I think he still had it, but as long as this video game is gone, I don't think he'll notice if he was, <laughs> if, if he was on fire, he wouldn't know it. 
as long as this video game was still going. So he said, no, I didn't have any such I don't know, he might have been at this door before, you know, or something. And like I said, I don't, I don't think Melchizedek would notice. Okay? But they had very, very mild symptoms or practically asymptomatic. And it almost kills me. I was circling the drain until they gave me uh, the convalescent blood transfusion. When they gave me that, instantly, if before I was in a coma, I came out of the coma three days after they gave me the transfusion, took me off the ventilator three days after receiving it, and the nurses told me that, they, you know, they pretty much thought I was going to die from what they had seen come in the door, you know, before then. You know, I was circling the drain. Okay, but that's, I'm going to tell that story, part of that story, Saturday. And you can't make people social distance and wear a mask. You know, the people that go to Trump's um, campaigns, they're adults. They choose not to wear a mask. The college students are not wearing masks. They're not social distancing. There have been people here who have gotten into fights here in Colorado. Going into, they showed one that had the security camera. This was a man, 60, white man, 61 years old, knocked a 21 year old buff white man on his behind because he asked him to wear a mask before coming into the restaurant. You've seen it on the national news. There have been at least two people shot dead because they asked somebody to wear a mask. The security guard up in Michigan, somebody else uh, in Atlanta, and another one in Tulsa, in, uh, in Oklahoma somewhere. It's nothing Trump, in my opinion, could have done, you know, to reduce our numbers. We have to have a vaccine. And yes, I'm in favor of political pressure to rush this vaccine to market. Oh, you know, we can't close down the economy anymore. We can't do that again. It almost is it's it, it's like almost wiped us out now. Right. We can't do it. I wrote a post uh, before, you know, several months ago, probably back in March or April sometime, in which I said, hey, we can't close down, even before, basically before the effects of closing down happen. Say, and I just simply said, some of us are going to get it, some of us are going to die, and some of us are going to live. I hope it's not you, and I hope it's not me and mine. And as it turned out, it was me. And like I said, I did everything. I wore masks, I sanitized my hands, I hit the whole house on the lockdown. They did not go anywhere. And I still got it. Right. It is not Trump's fault. Trump's rhetoric is not the best by any stretch of the imagination. This whole but thing about please be careful what you listen to. Just be careful where you're going and where you're collecting your information. You know, he's not responsible. Be more discretionary or be more he, critical of your information that you gather. He, he, you know, in America, we're too used to doing what we want to do when we want to do it. That's We are founded on that principle. The wild, wild west, and the Minutemen, everything. We do what we want to do when we want to do it. You know, China threw its citizens in jail, locked, you know, locked the country down. France and Italy, it was illegal for you to even come outside in France and Italy. You couldn't do, you can't do that here. You know, and... You know, Biden's on by. Only thing I heard Biden say was that I'm going to close the country down again if the scientists tell me to. I don't care if he made it a law that everybody has to wear a mask. People are not going to do it. You can't enforce it. You know, Biden hasn't said how he would have stopped this. I haven't heard him say that. I don't want to 
sound like a political campaign, Nick, but tell me how you would have stopped it. You say that it didn't have to be this bad, that you would have done what the scientists said to do. You wear a mask, that's good. I believe in wearing a mask. A lot of people don't. I just took my car to my mechanic. I, we got my son a car because he's got a commute between Aurora, Colorado and the University of Colorado Boulder campus since they've gone virtual. And, you know, we got him a car to help him do that. I had to take it to my mechanic. My mechanic doesn't believe in his workers. They don't believe in wearing masks. I go up, you know, take the car to him, and he still wants to shake my hand. I shook his hand. I had my mask on, though. I took, shook his hand, walked back to my truck, and sanitized my hands. And the car. And the car. <laughs> when we picked the car up from him, we wiped down the steering wheel, the dash, the doorknobs, you know, handles and stuff. Okay. Yeah. All right. People are not going to wear a mask. They're not going to social distance. And it ain't because Trump, like everybody, people talking about they don't believe anything Trump says anyway, like they're going to wear a mask because Trump wears a mask. Mm -hmm. Give me a break. But I've given you my evolution of why I support Trump. But now I want to give you the heart and soul of that evolution. It is not my personal emotions. beliefs. Right biases or emotions. It is based on the Word of God. I don't have a personal hatred for Anybody. members of the LGBTQ right. plus no. community. No more than I would anyone who ignore, ignores the Word of God. I don't like men who are unfaithful to their wives. I don't want to be around them. I will not be around If I'm find myself in the company of a group of men sitting around talking about how they're cheating on their wives, that'll be the last time I'm in, I'm in their company. I don't like, I, I don't like that. I don't like people who or want to associate with people who thumb their noses at the Word of God. That's my only bias, but why Am I against abortion? Why am I against same-sex marriage? Let me tell you. Go to Leviticus chapter 18. You can start right there at verse 1. I'll read it to you. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. After, after the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein you dwelt, shall you not do. Remember, he had brought them out of Egypt now. And after the doings of the land of Cana, whether I bring you, shall you not do. Neither shall you walk in their ordinances. Most Christians, I would probably say 99.9%, .9 do not know what the sexual practices of Egypt was or what the sexual practices of the Canaanites were. When I was in seminary, I did extensive study and research and wrote papers about the sexual practices of the Canaanites and the Egyptians. Basically, they were the same sexual practices that you would see in a pornographic movie. Exactly the same. And this was part of their religion. Every spring, the priests of Baal, a Canaanite priest, would go out into the field and have sex with a cow. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you knew that. They were into homosexuality. They were into the LGBTQ plus lifestyle, bestiality, abortion, or as the Bible calls it, giving their children to Molech, they were into all of that. Abortion, homosexuality, bestiality, incest, all of that was their practice. And they practice it as part of their religion. 
when they went into their temples or places of worship, that's what they did. The Bible talks about the groves and the high places of the Canaanites. That's where all of these things took place. So when you see that in the Bible, it's code for orgy. Right. It's code for a pornographic movie, although they this, didn't have any movie. I mean, they lived it. This is they didn't, they, they, right. you know, they didn't watch it on, you know, on the internet. They, they were doing it. it. There's some okay? great perversions. I, I, I did all the research on it. I kn see. Gross perversions and abominations. Remember, this is written to a Jew after the Exodus. They knew what the Canaanites did. Mm -hmm. Okay? They knew what the Egyptians did. So when God told them, hey, I don't want you doing that. And the whole context of this entire chapter, chapter 18, is sex. Everything in it. Every line. There's no other topic mi mentioned. Okay? Jumping down the verse row. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's sister. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister. Thou shalt not uncover, you know, the nakedness of thy father's brother. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy daughter-in-law. Thou shalt not lie with a, a man as, you know, right. as you lie with a woman. You know, thou shalt not have sex, you know, with a beast of the field. Every other lie, there is nothing else mentioned other than the prohibition against homosexuality or the LGBTQ plus lifestyle as we call it today. It's all about that. It's all about incense. It's all about the prohibitions against bestiality. If you want to jump down to verse 25, of verse 24 it says, 1820, defile not yourselves in any of these things. Defile is the key word, people. Okay. They don't believe that there is They're defiled. defiling. They, and that is a word that no one wants to think about today because they don't understand why God said these things. And he is telling us right there, you know, he wants us to be holy. The Bible is the foundation of all morality and ethics and a good, a good character, of the light, of the truth. So defiling is of darkness. Is being in contamination, contamination. Uh, just unholiness, and it is not a moral high ground and by any means, but people have been taught to believe that it is. That it's okay. That it's okay because, oh, it's love, we've it's got, love, but we've, we've gotten away it's, from, it's not biblical, love. you know, living a biblical lifestyle to living an LGBTQ plus lifestyle right. or whatever we think. The world has finally gotten people... You know, you know, pedophiles now, I guess pedophiles are in that plus on the LGBT people. Pedophiles thing. are pushing their rights now as they if say they've they been discriminated against. God made me this way. Right, right. God made me this way. Who are you to tell me I can't love who I want to love? You know, that I can't, is the argument. And I can't have young boys or young homeless. girls, even though I'm 60 years old. We're getting to the wickedness of man. Okay, it so said, verse 24, def defile not yourselves in any of these things for in all these things the nations are defiled which I cast out, out before you mm -hmm. and the land is defiled now I want you to note when God says and the land is defiled because of an LGBTQ Q -P plus lifestyle land is the foundation of all economic success and stability and security. If you don't have land, you have no security. Ask any homeless person. Okay? Mm -hmm. So God is saying that they can't make money here anymore. They have no security here. I'm casting them out before you. We're seeing that in America. We saw it at 9-11. Mm -hmm. We're seeing it with all kinds of attacks, with our economy 
crashing in 2008, with our economy crashing now in 2020 during the COVID crisis. We're seeing it worldwide, okay? Um, we're seeing all of that. All of, you know, China gonna come over and just write a check and buy and buy the country. Okay? They're buying out Detroit. Yeah, they already bought out Detroit, my home city. Yeah. Chinese are buying up blocks and blocks in the inner city there. I'm just sitting on it, just let it sit vacant. Okay? Now, verse 25. And the land is defiled. The land. In other words, your economic stability is now shaky. And the land is defiled. Therefore, I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it. God is still good. Instead of putting the iniquity on us, he puts it on the land. He gives us a chance to repent. Therefore, I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it. And the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. It didn't say, it doesn't say expelled. Vomited. You know, when you vomit, that's violent. I've seen people vomit from, say, right here to halfway across the room. I've seen it leap out of their mouth mm -hmm. about five, six feet away. It's a violent. It was sick, you know, uh, if you've ever been sick vomit. and vomited, you remember your whole body convulsed and exploded. He didn't say that, okay, I'm taking the land from them, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to expel them. The land. I mean, he, said, he said, the land. For those people who believe in Vomited them out. Mother Nature said, no more, I can't take any more of this. Because what they're, do, what they're doing is defiling. And that word vomited, vomited, is a Hebrew word, and it means to vomit. It doesn't, it's not just the creative writing of a biblical writer. That word means to vomit. Mm -hmm. You know, violently. And it said, if you do these things, the same thing is going to happen to you. But my brother said, so you're voting for Trump because he introduces legislation, legislation that you're in favor. I'm in favor of that legislation because I don't want to be vomited out of my land. Amen. I don't want I don't to be living either. in a, you know, in a cursed country. Man, cursed country, that's right. And okay. we've been walking in this curses too long. It's a and that's what, you know, that's what COVID-19 is a curse on the land. Because of the LGBTQ plus lifestyle, not to you mention incest and abortion. Yes, but I'll curse with the land. Okay. Go to chapter 20. You know, you read Leviticus chapter 18 for yourselves. Okay. It's the third book of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Leviticus. Mm -hmm. Boom, right there at the beginning of the Bible. Go to Leviticus chapter 20. Okay? You've been talking about the LGBTQ plus lifestyle. And let me say this. Sister Leslie and I both have family members who are in and who were some of the past in that lifestyle. And we love them. We like seeing them at, at family events. Go visit them. You know, if we're going through that part of the country traveling, we stop in and see them and have dinner with them. We love them. We have classmates who are in you know, I'm going back to school at my age, I'm 63, I was 63, September 30th. I'm sitting there with young people and a guy sitting there wearing a skirt in class. I just go, oh well, you know. Now this semester, we got a teacher wearing one who's a man. Both, you know, there's out to go, mm -hmm. oh well. You know, I mean, we don't go around... You know, being disrespectful to people okay. who are in the LGBTQ mm. lifestyle. You know, but we are against that lifestyle. Right. 
Right, but not against them. But not against them. I mean, sometimes we go out to eat, and the waiter is a member of the LGBTQ+. They're still around us. And I, yeah, and I'll say to myself, boy, he was such a nice person, I'm going to give him a good tip. That's right. We don't discriminate. You know. Uh, the only time that you have to discriminate is if you get a moral issue, is when you're trying to teach a moral issue, and they don't agree with it. Yeah. You know, uh, right. well, you it's know, hey, shame. what did Trump say? It is what it is. Yeah, like okay. Now, Leviticus chapter 20. Now, this is something. It said, And the Lord sent, spake unto Moses, saying, Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel, of the strangers that shall join with you in Israel, inside the land of Israel, whether you're a Jew or a foreigner living in the land, that giveth any of his seed on the Molech, that's abortion, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. Because of the blood of Jesus, praise God, I don't have to stone anybody with stones. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. up until the day you die, you have, you know, the option for repentance. Mm -hmm. I will stone him with stones, and I will set my face against that man, and will cut him off from among his people, because he hath given of his seed on the moment to defile my sanctuary, defile my sanctuary, and to profane my holy name. Mm -hmm. Okay? And it, okay, now here's the, here, ooh, here's where it gets deep. And if the people of the land do any ways hide their eyes from the man when he giveth of his seed unto Molech and kill him not, then I will set my face against that man and against his family and will cut him off and all that go or whoring after him to commit whoredom with Molech from among their people. According to the word of God, it's not enough that I'm not a, you know, that I don't engage in the LGBTQ plus lifestyle. That's not enough. I cannot simply ignore it. I have to do something about it. I have to try to put an end to it. The only way I can put an end to it is vote for a party and their platform and a man I don't know what you did. Well, go ahead. You can vote for a party or platform of a man. Okay. That is against that. Someone who will anoint, uh, well, you can say anoint, who will appoint Supreme Court justices okay. who maybe will overturn Roe v. Wade or pass other laws that take the teeth out of Roe v. Wade. If I stand by and watch people perform abortions and don't say anything about it, don't do anything about it, not just say something about it, but don't do anything. Because here it says, you know, in the Old Testament, I'm supposed to kill them. Now, we don't do that, of course. I believe because of the blood of Yeshua, we don't do that. The blood of Jesus. But I'm certainly not going to vote for Biden and the Democratic left who don't do anything about it, condone it, say it's okay. I certainly cannot vote. I cannot vote for Biden. I cannot vote the Biden-Harris ticket. I did not vote for Obama under any one of his terms, first or second. I will never vote for a party that condones abortion and supports the LGBTQ plus lifestyle. Unless you want our land first. 
You know, <laughs> as for me, the Bible said, you know, what did Joshua or was it Caleb? Joshua said, or Caleb said, as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. And forget about afterbirth abortion. That's not oh after my birth. God. Kill a baby because after he was born. That's unbelievable. You know, when Roe v. Wade was first adopted as the law of the land, I don't think anyone ever imagined that it would come to this, where we would have partial birth abortion, and now even laws being passed where the baby can just be born crying and kicking and, you know, screaming and breathing, and the doctor kill him right after birth, completely out of the womb. They're trying to get us to do that now. And that's okay with people. Give me a break. Come on now. Come on. And these same people want to put people in jail for mistreating a cat or a dog. Right. If you killed a kitten, they'll put you in prison today. They will put you in prison if you kill a kitten. But yet it's okay to kill a newborn baby? When will it end? We didn't think it would get this far originally. Will, will it be up to a year old? You know, if the child develops uh, certain birth they defects? Can, they can convince you to, to anyone that it's okay that, that you're being loving by killing. And I've seen those bulletins. You're loving if you kill your baby so they don't suffer in the world. They're actually putting that out there. Man. So, oh, they're putting that out there. It's just, and then, oh, it's just unreal. It's insane. I, you know, it, it is. That, that's insanity. That's insanity. And the argument on the left saying that, oh, well, that means you're going to take care of it, right? You really want to raise a child and you can't afford it? Raise it in poverty or whatever? And, mm. and it's like, okay, that's oh, that's yeah. not a reason to have an abortion or kill. You give up all hope because a person has yeah. a weakness in thought. And so if you want to know why, in a nutshell, I support Trump, read Leviticus chapter 18. Read Leviticus 20. The context in both of those chapters is sex and, and abortion. Okay? I'm not twisting the word. It says it flat out. If you want to read, you know, we're not talking about one verse in the Bible. I'm talking about two chapters here. 18 and 20. And I can give you two more chapters. Read Judges chapter 19 and Judges chapter 20 if you want to get an idea of what God, I'm not going to read them there, but what God thinks about homosexuality. And there's scriptures How he's against it. And in the New Testament. And in the New Testament, Judges in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, read Romans chapter 1. Mm -hmm. Read what the Apostle Paul says about men lusting after men. And women love sin after women. The final two or three verses of that, uh, I think it's about 50 verses in total. Let me just double check it. I'm not going to read it. Read it yourself. Read Romans chapter 1. Okay, I'm going to do chapter. All the way down to verse 32. In the last few verses, it says, those that do this and those that agree with people who do this, LGBTQ+, are worthy of death. It doesn't say, it doesn't say to kill. Paul never killed anybody. Nobody in the New Testament ever killed anyone. Okay? He just said they're worthy of it. It would be fitting for them to be put to death. Okay. So, read Leviticus 18, read Leviticus chapter 20, read Judges chapter 19 and chapter 20, read Romans chapter 1, and there are plenty of other verses through the Old Testament as well as the New Testament that talk about, you know, homosexuality. You know, and then what's, what's that uh, one where it says, you know, effeminate men? Won't inherit the kingdom. No, let me look at that. Okay. 
real quick. So, you know, we're not talking about one verse or even two verses. I'm talking about chapters. I've given you at least five chapters. Four in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament. By, written by one of the most prolific writers of the New Testament. The Apostle or the Shilikim, the Shilika Paul. And that's why I'm supporting Trump. It's uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, where it says, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Mm. And it goes on. That's homosexuality. Mm -hmm. okay. So, that's why I'm voting for Trump. That's my evolution. Okay? Mm -hmm. I'm not an Oreo. I'm a spiritual being. Yeah. An observer of scripture. Okay? You want to call me an Oreo? Go ahead. Right. Biden, you want to be like Biden and say I'm not black? You want to say I'm brainwashed? I'm crazy? But as I challenge you, tell me one single thing that Trump has done that's detrimental to black people. He's lowered our unemployment rate. He's released many of us from jail. What has he done? He's helped, I mean, he's given aid to the HBCUs. Oh, yeah. He's given millions of dollars to HBCUs, you know, to black colleges. I heard someone say, well, uh, Obama tried to do it, but the Senate blocked it. Well, okay, let's say that's true. He's not blocking you. Us. You know, he's not blocking. That's right. He's giving it up. So tell, you know, other than this rhetoric, you know, they say he gives a sign to white supremacists. He didn't condemn white supremacy in the debate. I think he did. Because Chris Wallace asked him if he was prepared, and he said, sure. Right. He wasn't definitive, but Chris Wallace was cutting him off at that time. But that's his fault, because he was cutting off, and so he didn't, he didn't get his own point across. You know, he was the one that was started the interruption and the ruckus, yes. He's a brawler. Maybe he's a bullier, like some of people say. But as Trump himself said, you may not have liked what I had said or, or the fact that I downplayed this, but my actions did not downplay anything. We will back, like I said earlier, we would not be this close to a vaccine. We would not have these rev revolutionary therapeutics that are saving people's lives. A therapeutic that saved my life, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. A therapeutic that's, you know, apparently is saving his life now. Since he, you know, he was released yesterday from the hospital and will save many lives. You know, Biden listening to the scientists and Fauci's behind, it'll be two, three years before we have a vaccine and therapeutics. Fauci did that during the AIDS epidemic. There was a, a treatment that would have saved thousands of people's lives, and Fauci refused to give it approval. It was two years before it was, he wouldn't even give money for the trial. People out of their private pockets, out of their personal income, gave money for the trial that wasn't approved until two years later. We can't wait two years with this. We can't wait a year. We can't wait another year for vaccine and treatment. We have to weigh that against, okay, let's say there is something wrong with the first uh, generation of vaccines. That it is detrimental. How many people are going to die because they don't get it, as opposed to how many will die if they do get it, and how many will live if they get it? You know, 
uh, a vaccine is never 100% safe. Some, you know, everybody, you know, people respond differently. Okay? So, weighing all of that, we got we got to have this vaccine. We, we need it before elections. Definitely before the end of the year or by the end of the year or as soon as we can get it. And the therapeutics mm -hmm. that they, you know, are holding up. Trump, being the president, he had to get special permission to get those experimental drugs. When they gave it to me, it wasn't approved yet. When they gave me the, the, um, the transfusion, it wasn't approved. It didn't get approved until I was out the hospital a month. I didn't have a month to wait. I didn't have a month to wait. That's right. Hear that? I did not have one month to wait. I did not even have mm -hmm. a week to wait. That's right. We need it now. I'm a black man. If a vaccine was available, I'd take it. And I'll tell you a little story. When I was in the hospital, COVID affects your mind. People don't realize. It turns you crazy. You hallucinate. You get all types of crazy thoughts. I thought they were trying to kill me in the hospital. They had to hold me down. They called Sister Leslie up and said, this boy <laughs> done went crazy. Is there anything that you know that we can do to calm him down? Yeah, He's dumb. kind of a big guy. And this is all because of the uh, lack of oxygen. He, his oxygen levels dropped to like 66. 60, yeah, 65. He was 60, so. yeah. The they said I was in danger of my heart going into ca cardiac arrest when your oxygen levels are that low. They were worried about President Trump's oxygen level dropping to 93. Yeah. And I was watching that and I said to Sister Leslie, oh, you call yourself a COVID <laughs> survivor? A COVID survivor? 93? <laughs> That ain't nothing. That ain't nothing. I had 65. <laughs> and I was still kicking. You know? Sure enough, that was the Holy Spirit. I'm a real man. Honestly, glory to God. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this I was is something down else. to 65. And they worried. They did. Yeah, they, they, they were down like. down to 93. The paramedics, the, the firemen that were checking him and pick, pick him up at the home, at our home, they were just shocked to see his, his oxygen levels that low. They were like, they were so scared to move him. They were like, oh my gosh, he should already be in cardiac arrest, but he's not. And if we move him, it just put him there. Yeah, they, had, they stabilized me first because mm -hmm. my sons were trying to get me to walk up the stairs. They were remember. trying to carry me. Yeah. And they were about to try again when the fireman came. And when they got my level, they were like, don't touch him. Yep. Do not touch him. Don't touch him. You know, so. The so guy was good all the way. If you're out there listening, please tell me. Some not some stuff you say. Trump flashed the sign. Trump said they're good people on both sides. Uh, you know, white supremacists and black lives. Black lives matter. It's a distraction. We're out. We're out rioting, burning down the businesses. Black-owned businesses in a lot of cases. Black folks who've been saving up all their life got their whole life tied up into this business and some fool comes and burns it down talking about black lives matter you know my father owned three small restaurants if you'd have burned one of them down we couldn't have come back from that we didn't have no insurance we just would have been you know SOL mm -hmm. you know what out of luck as the saying goes. Burning down black businesses, talking about Black Lives Matter, to protest, I don't know how many, I'm throwing a number out here that I heard somewhere, you know, the 12 or so uh, black men and women who are killed or who are murdered by the police every year. Forgetting about we're murdering and here's one estimate. I've heard one estimate of 18 million black babies killed through abortion, all the way up to 25 million. And not to mention killing ourselves and black on black crime. Okay. All of that 
letting that go. But we're going to get out here, march and riot about the dozen or so that are killed or murdered by the police. And I get it. I get it. Like I said, I've experienced racism. Mm -hmm. Okay? I get it. I know it. I've lived it. I've been through it. I'm worried about my sons. I got seven sons. I'm worried about them having to go through it. I'm nervous when they leave the house, especially at night. Right. I don't care if they're walking or driving. I'm nervous about it. You know, but Jesus said, you people strain at a net. You're making sure that a net, a net, doesn't touch your food. But in doing that, you swallow a camel. That's what Black Lives Matter is. They're straining at a net, a net, yeah. and swallowing a camel with abortion. He also said, this you ought to have done. Yes, we need to protest the police, but we cannot neglect the weightier things of the law. Abortion, LGBTQ lifestyle plus, or especially abortion by itself, is the weightier thing of the law. You know, he was responding to people who said, Lord, Lord, we've done this in your name. We've, give, we've given tithes and mint and the olives and this. We've done all this. And Yeshua said, yes, these things you should have done, but you have neglected the weightier things of the law, love and mercy. When you vote for abortion, you're neglecting the weighting of things of the law. You have no love or mercy on those unborn babies. And now, the born babies. Right. Okay? And it's sad. Very. That's why I'm voting for Trump. You guys have a good one. God bless. Shalom. Thank you.